I know it's been about an year uh, that you've been living in India. I mean, when I look at your, you know, uh, journey, right? You spend mm -hmm. most of your time abroad. I mean, you know, 17 out of 24 years, that's like a lot of time uh, abroad. Yeah. Uh, so with that, like, how is the life here? Um, you know, you had these, uh, some stereotypes or some convictions, like, you know, this is what you've been told uh, in Western world or abroad. Um, but since you've been living here, can you share how it's been going and uh, the things that you had some assumptions, you know, in a pros, cons, uh. Hello everyone, hope you are all enjoying your week. Uh, today I am excited to have Sudarshan on our show. Sudarshan was born in India but uh, pretty much lived abroad uh, throughout his life, uh, you know, doing his uh, studies pretty much abroad for almost 17 years. And now he is spending time in India for the last one year. Uh, it's a different perspective. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Uh, with that, welcome Sudarshan to the show. Welcome. Good morning. Great. Uh, so Sudarshan, if you can share a bit about your background, um, you know, the countries where you lived, how was your life abroad? And that would be great. Yeah. So my name is uh, Sudarshan. And... Uh... I was born in uh, Chennai, in 2000. So we are like we, we like have like a Tamil Malayali background. We are uh, South Indian basically, and we moved abroad in 2003 to Australia the first time. We were actually living in Delhi at that time, but then we lived to, uh, moved our location to Australia, and that's where I did my KV, kindergarten, uh, preschool, as well as my first grade, and uh, then for. So Australia four years basically, and then for some reasons we shifted to Germany. From there, uh, my parents are in the academic field, so uh, I shifted to Germany when I was in the second grade. I would have to re had to repeat the second uh, the first grade I think because of the language. So uh, I it was, the language was really tough at that age already. Was just, I was six or seven years old, but it was very very tough. But uh, because you're so young, it's kind of manageable. I think still survivable and that, that we lived in Germany for almost 13 14 years actually that time we had so till my graduation from school a level graduation and then my bachelor's as well uh, three years bachelor's and uh, one has to really imagine we had no absolutely no clue of ever coming back to it there was not at all on the timetable not at all on our plans it was we, have, we had absolutely no plans going we had built a house in Germany we had um, own the house. We had land. We had uh, we were like, I would say, uh, like I would say the upper middle class almost in Germany. We were already the upper middle class, so we were not at all in a bad condition. And um, but things started to change during my bachelor's. I think when I start when I got out of school, I think slowly, I kind of realized that um, this isn't the life I would have imagined, like living uh, in a country like Germany isn't exactly an immigration kind of a melting pot. That is one thing which is also to be mentioned, which is not really a negative or positive thing. It's just a description of what Germany is. It's just yeah. not a, yeah. it's not like California where you have 50%, 60% immigrants or something. So you have a, um, so yeah, it's a bit more tough to kind of mix in. And then you also have very, very few Indians a very very few Indians who are like us or South Indians, very highly educated. The only few Indians who are there are actually uh, came very recently for IT purposes in IT companies. They have internal transfers or people who came back came to Germany maybe 50, 60 years ago for labor, for example. So yeah. really, but Indians living in Germany is um, it's a very short phenomenon which happened like this. A uh, few years, 10, 5 to 10 years it happened, I think, for some time with the IT boom, etc. But even now, it's already falling. So if, if you now already search on YouTube, it's already declining. So that's when I realized it doesn't really work out. This life is not really working out here. So I tried to apply for an uh, exchange program in my university in UK. Okay. Youngster. So, and I got through because of, uh, usually it's very tough to get through, but I got through for a variety of reasons of, COVID, etc. I got through and I went to University of Leeds and I got an opportunity to say, uh, discover what is the life of Indians in UK, yeah. diaspora as well as immigrants. And 
again i i think i arrived in uk with a very idealistic uh, i thought this is you know like this is like kabhi khushi gham or dilwale dulhaniya le jayenge i thought this is really very beautiful <laughs> we land up there in the first i think first day or two days i was like um, you know where the hell am i ended up in because uk actually has a lower level of development than germany so okay. uh, the roads are much worse the crime is much higher in uk the it just looks like you reached hell i would be really honest because the weather is also worse mm. so germany uh, germany has much more sunnier days also for example so i had this idealist view of uk and i arrived there and it was an absolute disaster the first week i think the airbnb lady she stole some 500 pounds from me then um, oh uh, it was so it was like a scam uh, i guess i landed up in a in absolutely wrong neighborhood because uk unlike germany has very div- divided neighborhoods which is a very anglo sphere kind of phenomenon which us and america and i had no clue about that i i thought like you know kahi bhi reh lo anywhere in yeah. city book a airbnb will be fine but i booked an airbnb in the worst kind of areas crime and then i called up my university please can you save me can you uh, arrange some room for me somewhere and then they said just come over we have a room for you and i literally just ran away i, just, I didn't even tell the owner so it was an absolute disaster and then obviously there um i again started to discover how the diaspora community, and also it was very weird because uh, the diaspora community in the in in uk kind of has the i mean the the pass which gives you an entry in that kind of social groups is your british english accent mm-hmm. so if you have an indian accent in english accent you are kind of considered a a lower a lower person a lower hierarchy person and you're considered you're from india but i obviously wasn't that i obviously have barely lived in india i have my passport is much more powerful than the british passport but because of my accent because i did not speak english in my school like i was not considered as one so that's when i was starting like my brain started oh, what is going on here because i mean our ancestors came went out of india for economic opportunities right we went out for building up a better lives because we had such lack of opportunities in our own country but now it's about cultural factors about accents and um and on the other hand an irish accent or a scottish accent is like a you know positive things like an attractiveness kind of you know so as a, things a bit weird so then i um, came back to india during covid and then i started my masters in scotland so I shifted okay. from england to scotland i was in leeds before in yorkshire and then i um, shifted from masters to scotland that was a much better time i really had a lot of fun traveling and uh traveling around so the traveling is very beautiful and also people are very sweet in scotland yeah. you know, they're very down to earth and they don't have any colonial past or the problems they don't have that mindset but uh, the indian community there also had that thing that you know don't go back to india you know, going back to india is like for losers people who have lost in life who have you no know, other choice and who, who decided that i mujhe kuch nahi karna hai zindagi mein i just want to go back so india is going back to india was like a um had a uh, kind of stereotype had a taboo so and i obviously had other opportunities so i had thought that okay uk is not working out because of the economy and etc uh, so i thought let's go to australia i had booked my tickets i had booked my flights i had booked everything accommodation got the visa done at the australian embassy everything and um, and there was obviously a very fancy to tell my friends also it's very fancy thing which the status is higher kind of you know like if you're telling i'm going back to india it's like you're going to look look down upon you so uh, but then when i came on the way going to australia obviously i stopped in india for one or two weeks and uh, obviously my pa- family members constantly saying why australia suddenly so they also had this questions why exactly australia i didn't really have an answer to that question because uh, there wasn't really an answer to that question and then i took the flight finally uh, and i landed in singapore and I met a friend there, an old friend of mine from his origin from Macau. So then we had to spend the entire day after the spending the entire day with him. I kind of in Singapore, I kind of um, I, I just called up my my family members and just told them book a flight back to India, please. <laughs> Can you book the next Indigo flight back to Bombay? Because <laughs> Indigo still flies to Singapore. Yeah. So it's not too far away. So I was like, 
I call up Singapore Airlines. Please, please deboard my baggage. And I collected them. They're very helpful, etc. And uh, I think in Singapore, I realized that uh, Singapore being a tropical country, being country which is very culturally also very similar. They eat also very similar kinds of food. They have very similar kinds of habits. Uh, they they don't wear fancy shoes and go into the metro or something. They 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 sometimes come in choppers or flip flops. But that doesn't mean they're poor. It just means that they're just very hot and very tropical. And and I saw this very tropical country being so successful. And I saw why can't India be this? You know wh- why aren't we just working towards making this possible rather than running away all the time? What what's the? And then I obviously saw the Australian crowd in the flight because uh, the, you know, the Singapore Airlines crowd is mostly Australians and or Indian Australians and they're very um. Are snobbish, very British, you know, very. It's like, as if they think this is great, and they're not at all. Um, like if you look at them, there's nothing you would be jealous about them for. You know, it's like. So I think that's how it changed my mind, and I just thought, let's come back. You know, let's. Wow. Um, no, thanks a lot for sharing such a, a detail, and this is like a like a cinematic decision, right? I mean, you know, it's yeah. almost like uh, as in movie on the way. Almost like heading there, everything sorted, everything planned uh, to Australia, and then you just made a decision uh, and uh, came back. So we will yeah. get to that um, that specific point, but I just want to touch on I think you know several things that you kind of mentioned, right? Uh, I know people have this um, you know stereotype of moving back to India is in a uh, is a step backward or maybe you know it's kind of looked down, um, but I think it. It, it it needs to be changed. I think, you know, in terms of like the opportunities, maybe it's people are not aware of what's going on in India. I think, you know, when was the last time when they have been to India to see some of the development before mm-hmm. they can come to, I mean, I think that's one thing that uh, we have to educate or communicate. It's just not anything uh, yeah. uh, as a uh, uh, looking down, but it's more of uh, having the facts and then make a decision instead of having the stereotype of like, you know, 20 yeah. years back of uh, what the image they have. Her- very hilarious example. You know, I used to, the way it was communicated to me abroad was like, you know, India is this very dangerous kind of country, especially for, for women at night. Like after 7 p.m., it's like if a girl goes on the road, she's going to get raped. That, that's, I literally thought that. Like, it was not like, um, that's the way it was communicated to me. Yeah. So I used to be so heavenly scared uh, you know, going out at, at night or even, um, uh, I usually think that, you know, I should not sit next to women in a me- public transport or in an auto or something because it's that uh, gender divisions are so large in India, etc. that women cannot co- um, come close to men. That is the way it was communicated to me in Europe and yeah. in Germany and UK. And in Hyderabad, there was once a lady who actually just scolded me, why are you sitting so far away? <laughs> why is this in Telugu she scolded me, you know, why is it you come closer, you save some space for someone else to sit there, you know? So, and then I realized after some time, you know, in, in Mumbai, servants come at 4 a.m. to clean the houses. Like, they come yeah. at, come alone at 4 a.m. Uh, in Hyderabad, especially in the, in the IT hub of uh, Hyderabad, you have uh, couples, women, young women, young men roaming around till 1, 2 a.m. Nothing happens. I mean, it's... Um, there are places in UK where I have had much worse experiences. In UK, I was once followed by a man, I think at 12 at night or something, he wanted money and he's not even a immigrant or something. He was a white local. So he, he wanted money from me and he kind of followed me for half a kilometer. So I've never experienced anything like that in India until now. So those are all things which are uh, uh, being spread abroad. I don't know why. Is it something political or is it something maybe also... I mean, Indians are very powerful abroad, especially in the US. We are very important for the economy, I would say. The startup industry, the innovation and entrepreneurship is very much steadfast, led by specifically Telugu, Tamils, in that regard. And there's maybe an in a kind of a ideological industry to make sure that they stay where they are. Like if they all come back to Hyderabad or Bangalore, it'll become Silicon Valley overnight because Oh, the talent is amazing, and uh, the knowledge they have will be just a brain drain for US probably or for UK. Yeah. So I don't know where it is, but that's what these things I realized when I came back. It's just very hilarious. It's it's a bit old. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just uh, curious, like um, I know you mentioned about uh, 
after doing the masters you have decided to uh, go to australia uh, so i i think is there any reason you pick that country just uh, compared to any other countries um, you know you kind of mentioned a little bit about uk and germany but why not other countries just curious about that yeah um because i lived in australia before so it, yeah. was, it was just like a very i would say um a uh, romantic approach kind of you know sun, what's the sunniest country uh, what's the um, country with the best economy etc those kind of things and actually uh, with the german european passport you have pretty much a free choice to go anywhere you have uh, the, the visa is so easy obtainable for uh, pretty much any country i think except us where it's a bit more tough but if compared with what indians have to go through when they want to go to canada pay 30 lakhs give your kidney go to the i'm over exaggerating obviously go yeah, to the yeah. embassy get a very good certificate going to i'm flying to australia i don't even need a visa i literally for tourist visa i just need to upload it online and 24 hours it's there and the reason why i why i realized that is the case is because germans don't leave their country as much oh okay they're very self confident about their own country they focus on their own economy even if a few people leave it already becomes like a national topic why are these people leaving <laughs> you know why, why why is this company leaving um uh, germany because they're very very uh, focused on national interest whereas in india it's just like a common thing for until now i think last now it's changing few years but it's like you know india mein kya karna hai abroad hi jao it's going yeah. to that's what it is and cool um so i want to touch about this um you know revelation or maybe this uh, moment where you realize this is what you want to do and then just made the decision um i know you kind of touched a little bit about like you know seeing the people in singapore you know some of the aspects um, but you also mentioned about meeting your old friends i don't know if there are some conversations that you had with this old friend or something that what like is there any triggering point or a flicker like you just like this is what i'm going to do because that's a big change it's a big decision yeah. on the on, on the fly so just wondering uh what's your thought process what's going on in your mind and uh, how you uh went making into the decision so i think it was a mix of many things i had a lot of conversations before already with a lot of uh people from germany as well on this topic like uh how because actually i come from a geography background so my, my bachelor's is in geography so we had this conversation very natural okay but the economic geography is my focus i love economic geography i still love it so we had this conversation about how why australia is so rich uh and in germany a lot of people emphasize that the mining industry plays a big role so um the land taken from the aboriginals plays a big role in uh the wealth of the, the government there and you, if you look at the data actually it does prove that actually a lot of the exports are mining because really valuable kind of assets like uranium um i think lithium coal as well so you have a lot of uh natural assets which australia has which it doesn't deserve it hasn't worked hard for it this corridor because this came there you killed the natives and you got that land right so and that is something which germans used to stress a lot because they used to stress that we are not like them yeah you know so yeah. we, we are not like the australian americans we have worked hard for our own country because our country is an asian kind of culture uh, so that's that is when i used to have some thought process in my head like wow, okay this is interesting hmm. um and i i picked it up later on but um and in singapore i think largely it was just the fact that uh, singapore is just very um similar to india actually that way look uh, culturally and kind of geographically it's just very similar because actually uh, there is a theory in geography called the geodeterminism theory okay so there is a theory in geography um, which says that tropical countries or hot countries are naturally poor mm. uh they are in in inherently poor because their climate is bad mm. that's a theory which is still widely practiced abroad and it's uh implemented also a lot of uh, articles and journals so you you have this thing that look the more south you are the poorer you are naturally so a country like india can never develop because it's hot so blaming it on the weather rather than on colonialism rather than on yeah or rather than anything else just blame it on the weather yeah if you go to 
Singapore, you, it doesn't make any sense anymore because it's it, it's a very tropical country. It's more tropical than India, in fact. It's, okay. In, I think Hyderabad gets more cold than Singapore ever gets. So um, that's when my brain started working. It doesn't make any sense. I think this theory has some other intentions, I think. Um, so, yeah, these are things. I think in... in and these are spread very softly, silently across the world. You won't, you won't realize it, actually. It'll just it'll be there in school, in, in UK and US. That no, no, I'm not sure about US, but I'm uh, even though I'm pretty sure they must be able to bring something similar. Uh, but in UK, I'm very sure they teach these things. In fact, uh, many the British are had created many theories of individualism, collectivism. Uh, the theory is also that... Um, Pagan religions are inherently violent. Mm. Those come from a Christian background, for example, that if you pray to many gods, you are savagery or you you have more violence in your community or societies. You need order. So those things are very softly, it's not very direct, but you you get those influences. Got it. So it sounds like I, I think you have this assumption based on like, you know, your interactions or the, you know, the, the thought process, but this revelation of like, in Singapore, seeing a country which is a tropical, but mm. economically so advanced, kind of triggered like you were even assumption. And then, you know, maybe yeah. a thought about, uh, yeah, moving. And uh, the same with Hyderabad was already, Hyderabad is already going on a role. And so it was, it was very inviting already. So I think that's, cool. yeah. yeah. Uh, so I know it's been about an year uh, that you've been living in India. I mean, when I look at your, you know, uh, journey, right, you spend mm. most of your time abroad. I mean, you know, 17 out of 24 years, that's like a lot of time uh, abroad. Yeah. Uh, so with that, like, how is the life here? Um, you know, you had these, uh, some stereotypes or some convictions, like, you know, this is what you've been told uh, in Western world or abroad. Um, but since you've been living here, can you share how it's been going and uh, the things that you had some assumptions, you know, in a pros, cons, uh, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so it's, um, I initially started off doing internships at urban design firms and urban planning firms. And uh, that's my field. Basically. My field is urban planning and urban design. And I really, first of all, got easily through because yeah. with foreign degrees, you, you're really preferred. You're really uh, taken much easier. You get the best salaries. So, uh, so I got through many places. I realized that that urban planning, urban design sector is a bit poor and weak in India for a variety of reasons, uh, which is, you can have another podcast on that separately. But uh, so I realized you have to have some, you have to have some uh, jugad, you have to adapt your career a little bit and change the stream a little bit. So I, I'm not focusing on academic urban planning. So I'm trying yeah. to go to the academic sector to contribute more with, with journals, articles, papers, research uh, in the field. And um, yeah, rather than going into practice, because practice is still very poor and it's still disorganized. In many ways, it's not very high paying as well. Yeah. Um, the government sector has not yet opened up yet. There's still a lot of uh, the colonial structures are still in place. The IS officer administration ref- exams, you know, there's still a bit... In Germany, for example, you can get in Directly into government job without any exam, for example. Yeah. Even many countries abroad, it's easy, but in India, it's not possible. So, so yeah, I changed my stream. I used my skills, my German language skills, to now get a job in a school. So, it's uh, it's not been uh, like a, a cakewalk, but it's it's been a, a a beautiful struggle, you can say, like a, a beautiful journey uh, throughout. And the, the assumptions of India, I think... Um, India is rapidly rapidly changing. So already the present is not as bad as it's portrayed abroad. Mm-hmm. If you go to Mumbai, Mumbai is a culturally, I would say, um, the best city in India. It's very open-minded. Whatever cultural background you come from or where you come from, you're very open in Mumbai. It's um, a very safe city. It's very cosmopolitan also. And it's getting good infrastructure now as well. So the metro is getting finished. And I think next two weeks it's going to be opened up and the coastal road, Trans Harbour Link, Navimbay Airport, etc. A lot of things are coming up there. Um, Bangalore has a lot of things that Mumbai has, but it has very bad infrastructure. 
and um, that's what it's working on right now and it's yeah. it has has a little bit of a safety issue at night uh, in some areas so bangalore has some issues hyder hyderabad is actually has very good infrastructure but it doesn't have the talent yet which bangalore has so it's like so every city in india has like working on a specific thing and indore for example is small towns are very very clean very well organized They're like i would say better than many american cities when it comes to cleanliness and garbage management so every city in india is slightly different but uh, they're nowhere close to as bad as put as it's portrayed that's for sure yeah for sure i mean i think uh, um, you know definitely to some of the examples that you have given right i mean you know the safety or you know you can't sit next to uh, you know a girl i mean those are all like very stereotype and uh, yeah. really, uh, it's, it's not a joke it's, it's very serious i mean it's really it's, it's portrayed that way so it's really portrayed that way that you know india is so dangerous that you don't even go close and and then obviously in bombay i think what shook my mind is in bombay at like 2 am you see uh, young school girls and boys going for ice cream at night so it's it's a bit unfair i think portrayal is unfair i would say it's just yeah. not uh, cool um uh, so i know i think uh, you kind of uh, touched about uh, your experience in the last one year so how do you see the future shaping up um you know uh it's still mm-hmm. one step at a time but uh, just wondering uh how do you see yourself like uh, either working or you know living in india or you know exploring some yeah. other place so just curious on that uh, i've been doing a phd in urban design and urban planning nice so i've been contributing through research and uh, and uh, because i have a international passport you have a lot of privileges in the quota you don't have to do any exams in one of the top institutions of iit you don't, you don't require any exams so you can just apply and you might even get in so that's it's going on right now but i hope to get into any uh, decent university in india and start my work and um, and then i'll yeah i'll become an academic so i became like right. my parents assistant prof- assistant professor associate and then professor got it and you know you can always help um, practitioners also on ground like the government officers who require um a lot of knowledge and theory on indian urban planning because they don't have a lot of theoretical and research based uh, support for an indian context like they have a lot of material for british cities or american cities but for indian cities how you should design a uh, good sustainable indian cities which are clean uh, well managed which have a good reaction time to urban flooding um those those research is very li- limited and that limits their ability to improve the quality of life in india kind of of urban citizens especially in this case so any bit of research any bit of data analysis is so helpful to them and they're so happy to have someone who can bring in a foreign con- a foreign mindset in indian give it an indian uh, paint basically you know and, uh like which i'm be i'll be focusing on nature based solution which is a um urban flood management concept which focuses on using nature or biological uh systems as support yeah no so thank not, you for doing yeah. that i mean again you know this is not a common field and this is such mm-hmm. an important one especially where we are in india right i think in terms of the development in, in terms of the infrastructure in terms of the growth mm-hmm. uh, these kind of uh, planning and uh, making sure everything is done in a right way would definitely go a long way so thanks for doing that so one yeah. question i have on this i know you kind of touched about it is uh, uh, you know especially for getting admissions in these universities mm-hmm. there is no need for any exams i know this is a common question that people have especially mm-hmm. who have studied uh, let's say till 11th grade or 12th grade abroad and then who mm-hmm. are considering about doing their bachelors or masters or uh, you know something in india Mm. uh do you have any like uh, insights or information on how that works for some reason i was under the impression that there is like this quota called nri quota you know yeah. it's like a limited uh, you know number of seats available for in each institution and especially for popular colleges it's just going to be very competitive very expensive mm. and all that stuff that's the information that i have but if you have any insights uh, you know especially in this use case where somebody did their uh, uh, you know education like till 11th grade and 12th grade but they want to do bachelor's here in india how does that work and what's the process uh, if you have any information that would be very helpful 
Yes, and I quote is quite easy to get in. Every university is different, also level like every private and public university is slightly different. But uh, and I and I quote is for those who have an Indian passport, and it's already easy for them. So I can already say it's very easy to get into private colleges, good ones also. Uh, public ones, it's it's not too hard as well because um, uh, because NRIs are still I would say a minority. Isn't it that there aren't as many NRIs as Indians are there? Even the upper middle class Indian population is massive, almost ten crore. So we we are nothing. We are a very small minority. And then you have the international quota, which is a super privilege. You have absolutely no requirements, no competition as well. I think it's extremely easy. And you have universities in India which are ranked somewhere one hundred fifty, one hundred in the world. Like not not as good as. I would say uh, Cambridge or anything, but you have you know climbing up the ladder is IIT in Bangalore, um, IIT in Mumbai. These very high rank universities which already do world class research and uh, it's it's much easier than what it's thought. It's a little bit paperwork, okay, uh, because it's not um, a mass phenomenon yet. And, sure. And even if it becomes a mass phenomenon, it will still be a phenomenon of a minority because. So just to kind of. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so just to confirm, like, so even when you talk about like IASC or IIT um, institutions, right? So when you're talking on the international quota, is the requirement to have a non-Indian passport, or is it yeah. like someone who did their education abroad along with an international passport? So somebody might be already be moving here with an international passport when they're still young. They might have done their entire uh, education here. Do they also qualify in that bucket, or they have to do their education outside India? Um, yes, it's is easier if you have a foreign degree and a foreign passport. It's easier, um, but there are universities where there is there are exceptions. For example, so there are um, every university has a different approach as well because the IITs and ISCs have a lot of uh, free freedom to do choose what they want to do, how they want to conduct their admissions, etc. Um, so for for me, it's quite easy. I would say foreign degree, foreign passport. It's really easy and it's um very cheap as well. And so anything on the fees, I think you kind of touched on the cheap. Like, is there a differentiation in terms of the fees that uh, someone with an Indian passport pay versus someone with an international passport pays? Just too curious. Yeah, there is there is a difference. There's a, the fee is considerably higher. Um, but not more than I would say. Uh, even the most expensive private ones have not more than eight to nine lakhs. Like the, I think IIT Mumbai is one point five, for example. One point five lakhs per year. Yeah, and it's one of the highest ranking universities in the world. It's, uh, I assume Bangalore has I think around about the same, maybe ups and downs might be there. Sure. Some of the private ones have I think to eight to nine lakhs. So it's. Got it. Um. Yeah, I mean. Can, Compared to what we pay abroad, it's okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, on that. So is there anything that we haven't covered, uh, or anything that you want to mention to you know, uh, people who are considering to moving to India or giving it a try? Uh, anything that you want to share from your perspective? Yeah, I would say um, come to India, like spend some time in India and try to understand the Indian. Perspective or the Indian school of thought, and try to look things from an Indian perspective because it's it helps you um, shape your idea of of India in a more accurate manner. And uh, second factor, I would just 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 come. I would say it's the best time to come. Um, as a geographer, as an economist, we as a geographer, especially we we analyze the data and as the last twenty years, and the best the data right now is the best we have right now. We have low inflation, high growth. Uh, low population growth, so the natural population growth is also very low. I think uh, Telangana and South India have a fertility rate of one point six, one point five, which is very similar to what's there abroad. You have low inflation as well as high growth. Whereas in two thousand tens, we had a high growth, but we also had a lot of inflation, for example, which kind of annual the high economic GDP growth. So. It, so the conditions are really absolutely perfect. I would say just come and it's just gonna get better. 
no thanks for sharing that uh, with the factual data right i think you know yeah. especially from a uh, economy but i i don't know some people might think like i don't know if we're still in low inflation people are feeling the heat of increased prices after covid right i mean across the world but when you look at in a relative fashion yeah. um, especially for a developing country uh, i think india is doing better than the rest of other countries in terms of the inflation but the things have changed so much but thanks for sharing the thoughts from a Uh, actual quantitative data right you know in terms of like yeah. how you know uh, the country is doing and we also have a lot of infrastructure projects which are under construction right now which uh, will have spillover effects which are largely going to be positive and it's it's going to be hard to calculate those spillover effects as well because the our roads were so bad like if you, if you want to travel from mumbai to delhi it took you almost two or three days for a truck driver any car it was so bad like it was uh, people used to make fun of us but uh there's an expressway under construction which is going to shorten that time into 12 hours for example and that's going to have spillover effects which we don't even know right now because we're so much used to that bad infrastructure for so many decades that we don't even know kya hone wala hai when we have this good roads so yeah yeah cool no thank you very much for yeah. uh, sharing your thoughts your journey uh, especially the decision to move back to india is just you know like a cinematic and uh, and really appreciate you contributing to the uh, you know the urban planning the development right i think especially uh, which is very important uh, to where india is right now and there is a lot of infrastructures lot of uh, uh, you know growth in these big metros uh, definitely i think that planning would be a big big help uh, mm-hmm. so thank you for that and uh, wish you all the best i think you know with uh, whatever you do and yeah, good luck with lot. everything yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot sir and also yeah. thank you for giving this platform and thank you for doing keep you on doing this platform for people to share their stories yeah sure definitely thanks and have a great day thanks bye thank you all for joining us on this insightful journey of desi return if you enjoyed this episode and want to explore more stories and expert advice make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell Don't forget to leave a comment below with your thoughts and experiences. By the way, check out the links in the description below for our Facebook group and social media for updates and engaging discussions as well as connecting with fellow Desi Returners. Thank you once again and until next time may your Desi Return journey be filled with joy, growth and endless possibilities.